Getting angry at God. Hmm. Interesting subject. Go in your Bible to Matthew chapter 12. If you've never gotten to a point where you've been frustrated with the Lord, and you start to get a little bit angry at the Lord because you don't understand what He's doing in your life, uh, you'll get there in your life as a Christian. So we're going to talk about that today in this little study here. Matthew chapter 12, beginning, beginning in verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and the, of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. You say, well, that's a reasonable request. Well, it would be if uh, they just met him. The Jews require a sign. All throughout the Old Testament, God gives the Jews signs. And he's going to give them signs in the future in the time of Jacob's trouble. So it wasn't an unreasonable request if they had just met him. But the fact is these people were following the ministry of Jesus Christ for a very long time. And Jesus had performed sign after sign after sign, miracle after miracle. And they're scribes and Pharisees. They should have known the scriptures that prophesied of what Jesus Christ was going to do and when he was going to come and how he would be born and all the other things. They had all the signs right before them. You say, what's going on there? Well, it's like a lot of people on YouTube nowadays, online, wherever, in the professing Christian world. Um, could you show us a little bit more proof that the King James Bible is God's pure word? Could you show us a little bit more proof that the, that the catching up of the body of Christ will happen before the time of Jacob's trouble? Pre-trib rapture, it's also called. Could you show me some more proof of dispensational teaching? Could you show me some... I've already showed you. I've already taught you. No one out there has any excuse to use anything but a King James Bible if they speak English. Why? Because for years and years and years, men of God have come out and said, here are the new versions. Here's what's wrong with them. They came from the Vatican and they showed proof. I've been part of that group. Okay? I'm not the best King James only advocate, spokesman, whatever, but I'm, I've put my own work into it. All right? I haven't just repeated what others did. I did a massive collation on the NIV and the TNIV. All right? My own work, my own research. I brought out a lot of my own material, my real, or my, uh, the real Bible version issue exposed thing. I, I've been part of it. And yet there's still people out there and they say, I just need to see a little bit more proof. Just like the Pharisees and the scribes. Hey, I, I, I would be convinced. I, I'd love to believe in the pre-trib rapture if I could just see some more proof. All the videos and all the sermons that I've done and others have done out there defending what the Bible says that the body of Christ is going up before the Antichrist is even unleashed will be up there. And yet they still have questions. Not much changes. You know? And you're all going to deal with it in your own certain way. God called me into full-time ministry many years ago. And I've been dealing with this thing now for a long time. But as a Christian, you'll get to the point where you'll have somebody and they just question, question, question. I need to see a little bit more. Okay, I've, I brought up all these doubts and you know, questions and everything to you and you've answered them all, but I have a few more questions. And it's funny because if you actually look at who the father of that whole system is, the one who questions authority, it's Satan, the Garden of Eden. Yea, hath God said. The Pharisees and the scribes had no excuse at this point in time. And yet they come to Jesus and they say, Master, see, they, they try to pull the little thing. You know, isn't that so nice of them? Master. They aren't saying, hey, hypocrite, we need to see. Master, you know, um, we would see a sign from thee. You know, are they going to be converted? No, no. They just want to continually try to find fault. That's why they have an endless supply of questions. You talk to an atheist and they say, prove to me that God exists. And you say, okay, let me show you what the Bible has to say. I can show you prophecy that the Bible says if God is real, then he, would be able to, he wouldn't be constrained by time. He would know what happened in the past. He'd know what happened in the present and what is going to happen in the future. Let me show you the, the prophecies of the Bible. Okay, yes. Well, but I have another question. And you answer that question. But I have another question. They can just keep you going on for the rest of your life. But what does Jesus respond to this? And what should our response be to those people out there that would continue to question the truth after we have done our part to show them the truth? 
and love come to them and said, here is what the Bible teaches. Here is the truth. What is Jesus' response and what should our response be? But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Not burning in hell like the satanic new IFB teaches. Okay, Jesus didn't burn in hell. That is what a bunch of Christ rejecting, you know, God hating sinners believe. All right, and I've done plenty of teachings on that, so I'm not going to get into it. But what is Jesus' answer? We want a sign? No. Why? Because you're evil and adulterous. You're an evil and adulterous generation. You want another sign? No. No. How you have more questions with it? No. No. Why? Because you haven't come to Jesus Christ as a sinner yet. You're not broken yet. Jesus died and he was buried. And he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You say, well, yes, but I have questions. No. You're evil and adulterous. If you've, been, if you've had a Christian deal with you and you've had answers to questions and, and you just keep coming up with more questions, you are evil. Just as simple as that. You say, how does this relate to, to a Christian getting angry at God? We're going to see about that. Let's go back to the book of Jonah. When Jesus is writing there, you know, it's the New Testament's coming from Greek to English, so it's Jonas, comes out as Jonas, but he's referring to Jonah. Obviously, Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. So let's go back there to the minor prophets and get to the book of Jonah after Obadiah. These books are always, you know, <laughs> I don't. It doesn't matter how many times I've tried to memorize the orders of these of these, you know, minor prophets. It just it always eludes me somehow. You know, I just ever since I was a boy, you know, I went to was raised in the whole church building structure, and they'd have you recite the you know memorize the books of the Bible, the order of them, and I always messed up on the minor prophets, and you know, and then and then uh, you know as time has gone by, I still mess up on it from time to time. But uh, Jonah, we're going to actually read chapter three and chapter four. It's not very long. But I'm going to notice some interesting things here. Chapter 1, he's told to go to, to uh, Nineveh, and he doesn't. He goes to Tarshish instead. He knows better than the Lord, you know. He doesn't want anything to do with Nineveh and going to preaching to these people. And uh, a lot of times we'll do the same thing. Uh, go witness to that person, go lay a gospel tract over there, or speak up, and you keep your mouth shut, and you go do something else. Hmm. And then God's judgment starts to come down, and people kind of say, what, what's going on here? Uh, I think a lot of the reason that God's judgment is hitting this country is because Christians have shut their mouths. And you can apply it to the UK or to Canada or to Australia or to Germany or Belgium, you know, wherever. I mean, just pick a country. Christians shut their mouths and God's judgment comes. But let's continue here. Chapter 2, he gets, you know, swallowed by the whale, essentially there, and he's calling out to the Lord and, and whatever. Chapter 3. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, this is after he's been puked out onto the sea, or out onto the uh, dry land. You can read about that in verse 10 of chapter 2. And it says, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it uh, the preaching that I bid thee. Yeah, do what I told you to do, in other words. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an ex exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Um, how long is it going to be till America is overthrown? Or whatever country you're in. Uh, but especially America. There's an awful lot of talk about civil war coming. And it's not, you know, people, that shouldn't even be called civil war. It should just be called total breakdown of society. Because uh, you think Civil War, you think the South versus the North, you know, whatever, you know, back in the 19th century, you think of that war, uh, organized military, you know, fighting against each other. That's not what it's going to be. It's going to be total breakdown of society, total breakdown of law and order. It could happen through a grid down situation. I mean, let's just face it. I'm not getting conspiratorial here. I mean, our, our power grid is pathetic in this country. You know, you have an ice storm come through and people will be out of power in the wintertime for a month sometimes. All right. It's... 
it's not a very strong power grid. And you look at how the whole thing is structured together and the fact that the Russians can hack into the thing and the Chinese can hack in, probably I'm sure too, and there's talk of this thing or an EMP or whatever else, electromagnetic pulse going off and even a solar flare could knock the thing out. I mean, it's, it's very weak. And how many people could even survive without electricity? Something that a lot of people didn't even have 100 years ago, especially not 200 years ago, and yet you can't survive without it today. That's bad. How about the economy? Oh, we're 22 plus trillion dollars in debt, and that's not the actual debt, too. That's a whole other thing that I saw a professor came out, uh, Michigan State University, I think it was, and he came out and he said that's just you know half the, the real debt. Um, military expenditures far exceed the national debt. It's, it's insane, you know, but admittedly, 22 trillion in debt. Um, you can't keep doing that, all right? Uh, things are, are headed for some really, you know, <laughs> bad times there, very much like Nineveh. Yet 40 days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. America's going to be overthrown, all right? Again, you know, the uh, Russians, just uh, uh, Putin, not long ago, was did a conference, a big press conference over there in Russia, and he said that they basically have a hypersonic, you know, nuclear missile, essentially now. And the thing can fly like Mach 9 or something like this. I think it can go something like 300 miles in five minutes or something. And this thing could be used. There's no radar, no anything to block against this weapon. And, I mean, they could, they could turn the continent of, of North America into a, a wasteland probably within an hour or two. You know? Oh, but everything's going to be fine because we're God's nation and everything else. America's not wicked and... Yeah, right. America's one of the biggest exporters of wickedness and evil. And again, I'll get people and they'll say, well, why don't you leave? America, like it or leave it. Well, I'm going to. I am going to leave this country when I hear come up hither. Till then, I'm just going to be a thorn in the flesh to people that are too prideful. Verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast. How about that? You want to turn America back? You say, let's, let's make America great again. Okay. Uh, believe God and proclaim a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. I'd like to see Donald Trump do that. Supposed leader of this country. Of course, we know that the office of president is just kind of a joke type of a thing. But, you know, the, the leaders of this country. Take off your expensive suit and tie and go put some sackcloth on. Get a burlap sack and put, cut a hole in the top and slip it over your body and then go and sit in some ashes outside and don't eat anything. And just weep and, God, please forgive us. Please don't destroy this nation. You think they're going to do it? No, but we can still make America great again as long as we refer to the Bible and just kind of vague references and, and talk about God bless America and whatever. Yeah. Verse 7, And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Turn every one from his evil way. Oh, we can make America great. Okay, you better turn every one from his evil way. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. This country is going to be destroyed. And God could raise up a country like Russia to do it. And just wipe this whole continent off the face of the earth. Just blow it up as just a radioactive nuclear dump in the time of Jacob's trouble. There aren't any Western superpowers in the time of Jacob's trouble in Bible prophecy. There isn't anything like that. It's the kings of the east. Why isn't America there? America is this great, powerful nation. See? See, what the papists want you to believe is they'll say, America is mystery Babylon. So in the future, when America gets wiped out, they can say, Babylon is fallen. It's fallen. Uh, you know, it's, it, Babylon is no more. Mystery Babylon is no more. When the reality of it is it's the Roman Catholic Church. And they are still there. And then people are going, Babylon has fallen. America fell. See, see, see. And then the Antichrist shows up and they say, Christ has returned. They're setting you up. 
Verse 9. If you hear a noise in the background, it's our dog barking. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Let me just stop there because, again, the, the Hylesite, New IFB type Baptists, they'll say, if repent means to turn from sin or turn from wickedness, then I guess God was a sinner because he also repented. Uh, no, you read the context. And right there it tells you what the context is. All right? Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his, his fierce anger that we perish not? See, God can be angry and he can repent of that. He's changing his mind. He's changing direction, whatever you want to say there. He's changing. God is not a sinner. All right? So when God repents, he is turning from anger and wrath and whatever else that he's going to do to a people or to a nation. But when a man that is a sinner has to repent, he's repenting from evil and from horrible things that he's done and whatever else in the life that he's lived. You have to come to the Lord as a sinner that needs salvation. You need to turn from your self-righteousness, say, I'm a good person, I'm not that bad. You've got to turn from that stuff. All right? Context. Lost people don't get that, I understand. That's why these Jack Hiles followers and the new IFB and everything, that's why they don't understand something as simple as repentance, biblical repentance. They have to change it from going from unbelief to belief, even though it's funny because the Bible teaches unbelief as a sin. So they're still saying to repent of sin. But uh, whatever. <laughs> Verse 10, And God saw their works. Works meet for repentance. True in the Old Testament and very much true for today. I'm going to be a Christian, but I'm just going to go on and live however wickedly I wanted to. Just as wicked as I did in the past. My sin that Jesus had to die an agonizing death for, I'm just going to keep that. I'll take his death, burial and resurrection as my salvation, the blood that he shed. That's my salvation, but I'm just going to keep this life too. I get the best of both worlds. No, you don't. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Like I said, right there. There you go. Well, I think that I, you know, okay, then just, you know, continue in your sin. All sin is negative. Just continue destroying yourself and end up going to hell when you die. Wonderful. You say, well, then we have to turn from all sins to be saved. I didn't say that either. Okay. <laughs> Some people. Chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. He goes in there and he preaches, and the people basically do what the Lord told him to say. Repent. He's going in, repent. You need to repent. You gotta you gotta stop this wickedness, whatever. The people say, Oh, we got we have to do this. We have to do what this prophet of God says. And they're hitting the ground, they're in sackcloth, ashes, they're weeping, they're, they're crying mightily to the Lord, saying, God, please, forgive me. Calling upon the Lord, you know, again. You'd think that Jonah would say, wow, whoa, whoa, praise the Lord, that's great. He gets angry. Hmm. Verse 2, and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore, I fled before unto Tarshish. <laughs> My word. You know, get back to that in a minute. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. God, why did you waste my time? You knew that they were going to repent. I wanted to go to Tarshish. I, I mean, what was the big deal? I mean, you'd think that Jonah, you know, what, I mean, look at the attitude the guy had. You'd think that after being thrown overboard, Swallowed by a whale, he's down there and he's praying, God, please forgive me. I'm sorry for what I did. And he comes up, he's still bitter about it. He's still bitter. Have you ever been there? Um, I have. There's some things that I prayed about very, very hard. And uh, I thought, hey, this is great. This is the will of the Lord. And, and uh, I mean, there was a place... Not far from our property, I'll just tell the story. I'm, I'll just share my bitterness. <laughs> and, you know, and it was, I let people know about this on Patreon. I don't think I ever said this in a video publicly on YouTube, but, um, and I prayed about this place and I, and I put a bid in and, 
you know, on this place, it would have been, I think, five miles away from our property. It would have been perfect. Could have run the ministry from there. It was just exactly what we were looking for. It was perfect. And I was so excited. And I thought, you know, Lord, ha you know, gave us the money for this place. And, you know, hey, this is going to be wonderful. And uh, the day of the, the auction closing thing, it was, you know, sealed bid kind of an auction. It was a tax acquired property by the, the local area down there. And I get this email and uh and the guy says uh sorry you've been outbid by 275 dollars and i thought are you kidding me 275 i was outbid by 275 dollars and i'm thinking lord that was the solution we were praying for it was perfect it, it was exactly what we needed 275 dollars outbid why <laughs> you know what is what is going on here and you say, do you understand it now? No, I don't. I don't. And there's still times I, you know, I, I will go to look at some place or whatever else, or I see some place. I think, well, I can't afford that and, and whatever. And I, boy, it'd be nice to have this, but I can't do that. And I think to myself, what happened back there? My own little uh, Tarshish, if you will, I guess. <laughs> um, I, I still don't understand the thing. And you know what? You can get angry at God about stuff like that. I mean, you know, you'll get, there are certain things you pray for, you know, and years later you'll look back and you'll say, boy, I'm glad the Lord didn't answer that, you know, and and uh, I, I can see how he worked it out, but uh, there's other things that would just be a mystery to you. And you just think to yourself, I don't, I don't get that, you know. And the other thing that's really frustrating is when you're a Christian and you're trying to witness to people that are, that are lost and you know, you're trying to do your best and you think, okay, well, Lord, I need whatever, or please help me with this or, or whatever else. Cause I can do a much better job of witnessing to him and whatever. And the Lord just says, no. And you kind of, you know, what, what, huh? You know, why? And there's no answer. You say, well, then you should just quit on God and whatever else, or, uh, get angry at him. Let's see what happens. Let's continue. So he's saying, you know, you should have let me do my, my thing because you're just going to take care of it anyways. Verse 2. Verse 3 says, Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. <laughs> That's called bitterness. You know, hey, Lord, if you're going to mess my life up like this and just go ahead and kill me, what's the point of even living? You know? Verse 4. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? Verse 5, So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it, come, made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to, let, to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. Look what God does. Verse 7, But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. <laughs> and it came to pass, when the sun did arise, that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted and wished in himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. <laughs> Again, you know. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? Hey, you're concerned about a gourd, but you're not concerned about the souls of these people, Jonah? Hey, you're so concerned about this thing and this material whatever thing out there, a place where you can run the ministry or a vehicle or a job or whatever else, but you're not concerned about the souls of these people? Hmm. Um, maybe the Lord needs to put us in our place sometimes. Yeah. The, the old pride level starts to go up a little bit too much, and the Lord needs to come in there and just kind of knock it down a bit. 
Yeah. Let's finish up here by going to Romans chapter 9. I'll show you an interesting thing here in the New Testament to tie this together. And I'm going to have to get out and take care of my dog because they're outside right now. Out there uh, working on the lane. We got some snow, yesterday, well, last night and this morning. And so they're out there doing the, the lane and our dog does not like it when she has to be inside and, and uh, Catherine and Oliver are outside. So... Again, I apologize if you're hearing her down there having a fit. Romans chapter 9, verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. God has it all figured out. God is up in heaven. He knows things that we don't know and we can't know. We see through a glass darkly, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We don't understand things the way the Lord does. Okay? Verse 17, For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. You know one of the reasons God will raise up wicked rulers and wicked people and let them just continue with their devilment? Because it will come back to His glory. He can show, even though that man is wicked and whatever else, I can still just take him and just turn him and have him do whatever I want. Why didn't the Lord just say when Satan, you know, caused Adam and Eve to fall, why didn't He just say, okay, perish, boom, and Satan dropped dead? Why? Because God wants to show people He has power over every being out there, over everyone. And he can take anyone, including the devil himself, and say, you will do this, you will do that. He's God. He is all-powerful. <clears throat> Verse 18. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. What do you think happened to those Pharisees and those scribes that came to Jesus and said, Master, we would see of thee a sign. Um, were they hardened? I would say, yeah. That's why Matthew chapter 23 comes along and Jesus is saying, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, children of hell. He's calling them all these things. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? You see? Their hearts were hardened. And I'll tell you what, people here on YouTube, okay, this is a time when you can actually get on YouTube and you can see real, true Christian preaching and teaching. And it isn't just me. There's other Bible believers out there. And you can come along and you can watch us and you can learn what the Bible has to say about things. You can hear the gospel presented over and over and over and over. And you say, but I still have some questions. What's happening is your heart is becoming hardened. And I'll tell you what, it is so frustrating being in ministry, and you have people that come up with these questions and these doubts and whatever else, and you take your time and you spend your time to go through the scriptures and show people the truth and put together information and answer the critics and show why false prophets are wrong, and people come back and they say, but I still have another question, but I have another question, but I have another question. You know what you're dealing with? People whose hearts are hardened. And if you're not careful... You can get to a place where you start to actually, instead of getting angry at those people, you start to get angry at God. Because you see, you don't understand what He's doing. Just like Jonah back there in the Old Testament. He didn't understand all of God's plans. All he wanted to do, I mean, he tells them to repent, and they do, and, and he gets angry about it. And then he goes out and he sits there on the side of the hill and he watches. You know what he's hoping for? I think he was hoping for you know, God's judgment to still hit him. They repented. You know, God's anger's turned away. And Jonah says, well, we'll see about that. I'm going to go out here and sit on this hill and I'm going to watch what bad things happen to him. <laughs> Trying to figure things out. Uh, brethren, uh, this is our standard right here. And if it's a, something that's uh, not answered directly in here, like the timing of the rapture, the timing of the, when we're called up, uh, then it's none of your business when God decides to make that thing happen. And any attempt 
on your part or on my part to try and figure it out and figure out the exact timing and whatever else, you shouldn't be messing with it. God doesn't need your help to run the universe, and He doesn't need my help to run the universe. We are His servants, and you need to be careful to mind your place, mind your manners, so to speak. You need to remember who you are and what you are. You are a bondservant of Jesus Christ as a Christian, right? Don't get bitter at your master, or he might have to put you in your place. And I speak from example. I've had my times where I get angry and bitter at the Lord and whatever else, and he just kind of puts off some answers to prayer for a little while longer till I learn to shut my mouth. All right? But let's continue. Verse 19, Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed to say... Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? If you can hear that, that's my answering machine. Oh, they hung up. Thank you. I have my ringer turned off, but they still call and whatever else. Um, let's read those verses again. Sorry about getting distracted here. Between my dog barking and my phone ringing. It's always fun. Verse 20. Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed to say, form say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Why would you ask that question? Why hast thou made Why did you make me this way? Basically there. Why did you do this? Why did you even have me be born? Mm-hmm. Little got a little anger problem there, don't you? Yeah. Verse 21, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Verse 22, What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called not of the Jews only but also of the Gentiles? Yeah. Now John Calvin comes along in his idiotic papist mindset and he comes along and he says, well, you see, this is God. There is no free will here. Um, then why did God endure with them with much long suffering? The vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Why would you endure and have long suffering for people that are fitted to destruction? You see? <laughs> and it, it, it contradicts so many scriptures. Uh, the whole system of Calvinism is just idiotic. There's no nice way to put it. And it, Calvinism, if you don't understand, is God predestinates everybody. There are people that literally he creates them and they have no chance of ever getting saved. They are non-elect and they go to hell and there's nothing that they can do about it, which contradicts multiple scriptures. I mean, just you could just name them all. I've done a whole study on it. I'm not going to get into it here. But that's not what the verse is talking about. It's not what the passage is talking about. Right? It's talking about people that continually come with these questions and, and strifes of words and whatever else. They're continually asking things. And, and well, I don't really know. In other words, not willing to repent. All right? And it doesn't matter how much you as a Christian try to get to these people and how much the Lord shows them and whatever else. Uh, there's long suffering, in other words. You know what I'm saying? family member, co-worker, whatever else, and you have long suffering, you have patience with them, and you just try to show them the truth and try to show, explain from the scriptures why we take these stands and, and explain to them why the new versions are corrupt and, and why the Bible must be rightly divided. And, and you just, you endure with them with much long suffering, God working through you. And what do they do? Their hearts are hardened. That's why they fight so hard against giving up sin after salvation say it that way that's why they'll fight you on that so there's a whole lot more stuff I could say about that whole thing but it just it is it is the temptation is there and the error is there I'll say it that way to get frustrated with people and end up taking that frustration out on God you get angry with God uh, you don't want to do that. Okay, what you have to understand is there are certain people 
that uh, they're hardening their own heart and God is allowing that to happen. And uh, they are a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction through their own choosing, through their own free will. Uh, and it's not our job to figure out that stuff or whatever else. And, to, and you know, it's our job just to trust the Lord and uh, not to speak foolishly, not to charge the Lord foolishly. And uh, like I said, I, it's, it's something that we're all going to struggle with. Um, I'm not, I'm not gonna, going to stand here and tell you that, you know, uh, I've never foolishly charged the Lord. I've never been angry at the Lord. I have been. Uh, the situation I mentioned earlier, it still baffles me. But you know what? Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Go in there. Turn there in your Bible. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, if you don't know the verse, if you're newly saved. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Notice it does not say, and we know that all things are good, you know, that happen in your life, you know, to them that, who love God, to them who are the called according. No, it doesn't say that. Work together for good. There's a lot of things that at the time it's a really bad situation. You might lose your job. You might lose your marriage. You get saved. It happens a lot, right? Some woman gets saved and her husband doesn't and their marriage just starts to fall apart or vice versa. Some guy gets saved, his wife is lost. I've known both situations. I've dealt with people that have been through both situations. And uh, they get out of that situation there. They get out of the marriage. Uh, it's an unfortunate thing, but their, their spouse just does not want anything to do with the Bible. And they eventually have to just say, okay, fine. The whole thing just blows up. They're better off down the line. And you can see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. There is, you know, scriptural grounds for divorce. Uh, you know, name it. You lose your job. At the time, it's terrible. And you think, what am I going to do? Years later, you look back and you say, okay, I see what the Lord did there. I wouldn't be where I am now if I had kept that job. You might be a young person dating somebody and, and you get saved. You start talking about the Bible and they say, I don't want anything to do with you. And they go off and you think, that was the perfect one. I thought that, that he or she was going to be the one I was married to or going to be married to for the rest of my life. And... It fails. I had that happen. <laughs> you know, I, I knew a girl at one point in time before I met my wife, and I thought she is just perfect. I mean, it's just exactly the girl. I mean, she was just made for me, you know, everything. Nope, nope. She wasn't the one God had for me. And I didn't understand at the time. I was quite heartbroken. Um, but you can't get mad at God. Oh, that's going to that's gonna be a temptation, <laughs> right? And uh, the times when you're out and you're doing, you know, work for the Lord and you're witnessing for the Lord and you're, you're putting out videos on YouTube or, or doing studies for the Lord or whatever else, and you get these people, these wicked people that have, they're like the scribes and Pharisees, and they just keep saying, I, I have a question. I have another question. I, I, just one other question that I have that you didn't really seem to answer. And, you know, and you'll find a lot of times that, that, again, another one of the big things you'll see is people say, well, you didn't address this or you didn't address that or I have question. what about this, what about that verse? And you think, I talked about that in the video I made. I, they, you didn't even watch it. Again, that's a, another very common thing. And uh, you say, why would I get mad at the Lord? Well, if it goes long enough, you, you might actually start to get that to that point. <laughs> Especially when you see they're getting away with devilment. They're living in big houses. They got lots of money. And here I am, I'm struggling. Here I am, I'm having a hard time. Things aren't going so good for me. I've had some health issues and I've had some family issues and I've had money issues and, and whatever else. But those people out there, they can blaspheme God and they can lie about His Word and everything else and you're not even doing anything to them, Lord. What is going on? And you can start to get angry at God. Don't let it get to that point. Uh, remember, it's about eternity. That is where you will find your comfort. That's where you have to focus your mind on that and say, you know what? They might get away with their devilment here, but they aren't going to in eternity. They have all of eternity look, you know, to, to dread and to, and to fear. They're going to be going to hell and burning forever. The only hell, the only bad stuff I'm going to have to go through will be right here in this life. That's the only suffering I'm going to have to go through. Once the Lord says, come up, Heather, my suffering is done. 
So I hope that's a challenge to you today. Don't get angry at God. Uh, he doesn't need you to run the universe, brethren. And He doesn't need me to run the universe. He does a pretty good job without us. Okay? Um, we're not on His level. Nor can we be. Just trust the Lord. So, that is going to be it. I thank you for watching.